So, quick question, just so I get a, kind of a sense of the audience. Who here has seen every Miyazaki movie? Oh, fewer than I thought. Okay, fair enough. Uh, who's seen it, like at least half? Okay, fair enough, cool. Um, um, all right, so we will make that happen, we'll make that work. All right, I'm actually gonna start like a minute early because I have a lot to get through. <laughs> so, let's get into it. These are called kyoshi, I believe. Um, they're used in traditional Japanese art to represent the, the story's about to begin, the beginning of, of the show. And if you ever heard that in anime, that's what that means. So, welcome to me, Dr. Mythical Animals. Um, my goal with this panel is threefold. Uh, we're going to look at the origins of some of Miyazaki's creatures, where they came from, uh, why they were made that way. Um, I will probably disappoint a few people who have certain opinions about how Miyazaki, um, but we'll see where that goes in this. Um, that is not my intent, but it may just happen. Uh, I also intend to prove a theory. Miyazaki likes animals more than he likes people. <laughs> Um, it's, although it's actually a little more complicated than that as I, as I dug into it. So, um, uh, quick note, spoiler warning, I'm going to have to talk about the plot of some of the Miyazaki's movies. It's kind of unavoidable if I'm going to talk about, you know, the animals and what they are, what they represent. I'm going to have to talk about what they are in the films. So I will be talking about how some of these stories go, unavoidable in a panel like this. Um, and we're going to go way, way back to Animal Treasure Island in 1971 to begin with this. Um, this was conceived by Hao Miyazaki, he was an animator on it, and he also drew the manga adaptation. So he was very closely involved on that, although he did not technically direct it. Um, and this is an adaptation of Treasure Island with furries, basically. Um, and if you watch it, it has um, a lot of Hao Miyazaki's trademarks. A lot of big action sequences uh, with a lot of things going on, but nobody actually like gets killed. Um, a kick-ass female character who refuses to be a victim, and a very pleasant boy protagonist who's just kind of nice to everybody and is cheerful and takes a lot of punishment. And okay, it's basically positive and passes in the sky, um, <laughs> right down to the best. Although, also basically Conan from Conan: Boy in the Future. But you get the idea. Um, so yeah, Miyazaki like kind of likes to reuse things. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, and what's kind of remarkable about this to begin with is the fact that um, um, Jim and Kathy, the two uh, uh, humans, they're the only humans in the film. Everyone else is an animal. Um, now, yes, the bad guys are animals, but so are the good. So are some good guys, and so are neutral characters. So very, very early on, Miyazaki's making a work that is very, very animal focused. Um, I have not read of anything that indicates kind of why they went this direction with it. I think it's because, hey, kids like Treasure Island, kids like animals. Let's do those two things, right? Um, but we have that right there. And only a year later, Miyazaki would, make, uh, would work on Panda Go Panda, directed by Takahata, but something that Miyazaki worked very closely with him on. Uh, it is a story of a cute, precocious, little red-haired girl and in case you look, she looks a little familiar, that's right, uh, Takahara and Miyazaki have been trying for years to make an adaptation of Baby Longstocking, and they got turned down by the author, and so they were like, hey, we have all these character designs. Um, let's reuse them in this work. And so this girl, is, it's a cute little um, movie about this girl who is visited by a bunch of pandas, uh, two pandas, in fact, um, huh. <laughs> Looks kind of not, uh, okay, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's basically Toto. Now, while this is not like a, you know, animal-driven thing, um, or, you know, the, while they are not the protagonists, the animals are very much the drivers of the story. She is there, pandas show up, adventure begins, right? Adventure continues. Um, and in case you're wondering, well, you know, okay, but that's, like, that's kind of neat and inventive, right? You have a girl, pandas show up, why pandas? Well, actually, China had sent two pandas to the Ueno Zoo earlier that year, and Japan went panda crazy. Everyone wanted panda stuff. Panda, 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 
And then suddenly Miyazaki Takahata make a movie about pandas. Ah, so yeah, this was very clearly a response to that trend in Japan. Um, I do not think Miyazaki is a thief, but Miyazaki does borrow a lot. Uh, we have this, uh, it is easy, and I fell into this, um, uh, into this too, it is easy watching Miyazaki's movies to assume that everything he's done is a completely original idea out of his head. And there are actually a lot of inspirations that he drew on for his films, uh, which we'll see in a, uh, in a while, but as we know, um, uh, good poets borrow, great artists steal. So yes, this is part of, the, of China's panda diplomacy back in 1972, which resulted in uh, Panda Go Panda. But we have, in the space of two years, two very animal-focused stories from Miyazaki. Then during the 70s, uh, Miyazaki got really busy making the Lupin III TV series. Um, uh, and indeed, his season on Lupin III, Monkey Punch, he turned to be the most accurate Lupin uh, adventure ever uh, animated. Like he, um, so in other words, Miyazaki kind of set aside a lot of his own interests to make Lupin III like, really work. Yes? Not to mention the first animated film, feature film he ever did, which was... Um, Casa Cagliostro, yes. Um, but before that came out, um, Miyazaki came back for season two of Lupin III to work on the finale. Yes? What were his uh, specific arcs or seasons? Um, he worked on um, uh, uh, part one, so basically season one, effectively, of that. Um, uh, left, came back for, I believe, episodes 138 and 145 of, of part two, and that was the last he ever worked on it. Uh, and part 140, uh, episode 145 has this plot line involving this giant robot. <laughs> Yeah! Like, it's very definitely that robot. And hey, she looks kind of familiar. Now, what I'm going to show you is a screenshot from episode 145 of Lupin the Third, in case you're like, okay, kind of similar. Um, it's Nausicaa. It just is. Um, so, yes, um, uh, Miyazaki worked on this episode, and then later on, and he, he has said, this character became the uh, character design inspiration for Nausicaa. Uh, indeed, when I was in Japan a couple of years ago, um, I was in a Kinokuni of books and looked up and they had all these books up there um, uh, to buy and, and in a uh, glass shelf, there was this book um, and it had what looked like Nausicaa and Lupin on a tank. And I was like, I have to buy that now, like that's awesome. Uh, but it turns out it's actually from this episode of Lupin the Third. Um, so, Lupin, uh, sorry, Miyazaki worked on that, did Castle Cagliostro, um, which does not have, really have any animals in it, so not, we're not going to really talk about that that much. Um, but in 1984, he made Sherlock Hound, director for Sherlock Hound. I believe the first like 13 episodes of Sherlock Hound then moved on. Um, and this is an all anthro Sherlock Holmes story. Um, I, have, um, I have not read any indication of why they chose animals, I think again. Kids like animals, kids like Sherlock Holmes, put them together, right? It kind of makes sense um, in that scale. But again, you know, in the course of 12 years, he's made several different things that are all very, very animal focused. And we're in 1984, so of course, this is the year that Nausicaa comes out. Uh, his first original film, after Cagliostro. And um, so we need to talk about a few things when it comes to Nausicaa. First are the insects in Nausicaa. Uh, what Miyazaki has said is that when he was designing this idea of this sort of mutated future, whenever he tried to design just mutated animals, they just looked like mutated animals. What we'd say now is they all kind of look like Pokemon. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to make you know, changes to animals that feel really alien, but insects, the insect world, felt foreign enough that he could put that into his movie to feel strange. So the insects are all based on real insects, um, just changed around. So a lot of the flying insects are in the real world uh, swimming insects that he just made to fly, things along those lines. Uh, so basically tweaks to existing animals there to have the insects in Nausicaa. But then we have to talk about Teto, right? Um, Teto is uh, Nausicaa's companion. I think it's funny, you know, Miyazaki hates merchandising. He just despises the idea of merchandising. And yet he creates a cute little fuzzy animal companion for his main character. Hmm, a little strange. So. Fox squirrel. Um, we know he made it a fox squirrel because he wanted a mutated animal, right? Something that was not 
So it's something we're totally familiar with. So kind of blended these two together. But it's interesting he chose the fox. To talk about this, we can make a quick detour into the idea of yokai. Uh, yokai are traditional Japanese folkloric animals. And one of the most important things to understand about yokai is that we have no direct equivalent to yokai in Western folklore. Yokai are not goblins, trolls, things along those lines. Um, yokai are supernatural creatures. They could be completely distinct species of creatures that live entirely in a supernatural realm and only cross over occasionally. They can be real creatures that have supernatural powers. So, for example, foxes in yokai might be um, they might be creatures who come along with Inari, the god of the harvest, and are sort of guardians and protectors when Inari shows up. Um, they can be just completely neutral creatures, or they can be very frightening tricksters who um, mess with humanity a lot. Um, so it's interesting that he chose an animal that has this very strong folkloric tradition in Japan, and we see that in Nausicaa. It is noteworthy that Teto is basically just there to be a cute, fuzzy animal, except for one particular moment um, when Nausicaa gets angry. Teto very pointedly leaps off Nausicaa's shoulder when she loses it and she sees what happens to her father. And he does not return to her side until she comes down again. This is a much stronger theme in the manga. It happens over and over again. Teto represents Nausicaa's sort of connection to herself. Teto, when Nausicaa you know, loses herself, she loses her connection to, the, to nature and to animals. That represents this disconnection with herself. And once she recenters, the animal can kind of come back and reconnect with her. So we're seeing this very close connection, um, very close symbology between the idea of not just people being people, but people needing a connection to nature to be whole to be their, their full selves.